Hey everybody, welcome back to Chem 104. We're at chapter 7, part 3. So if you have not watched the other two, especially part 2, part 1, you can take or leave. Don't have to watch that one for this to make sense. But you need the second part in order for part 3 to make sense. So make sure you watch that one first. You understand those simple calculations before we dig in to part three. What we're getting into now is what other more traditional textbooks would call stoichiometry. If you've heard that word before in high school chemistry and it kind of caused panic, we're going to work on that. We're going to make sure you're okay. We'll start slow. Mole relationships in chemical equations. When you have a balanced chemical equation, you can read the number of moles straight up from these coefficients. And we can equate those moles to mass. Let's talk about how we do it. Law of conservation of mass. It indicates that an ordinary chemical reaction, you can't des destroy or create matter. No change in the total mass occurs, so the mass of the products is equal to the mass of the reactants. Because of that, we can do fancy calculations with moles and grams. Tarnish, which is silver sulfide, forms when silver reacts with sulfur. Tarnish happens on like actual silverware, not the you know utensils that you get from whatever store you shop at that are shiny, but they don't they don't tarnish. The real silverware made with silver will tarnish and that's why you have to clean it. If you measure out some amount of silver and sulfur and you make sure that it's in the right ratio in terms of how much mass you need to completely react to make tarnish, you add up the amounts on these two scales here and here and it equals what you see for the product. That is a demonstration of the conservation of mass. When we consider this equation, we've got iron, we've got sulfur, we're creating some kind of iron sulfide, iron three sulfide, you can read it as not just two and three, but two moles of iron and three moles of sulfur, making one mole of iron three sulfide. If we know moles, then we can do math to figure out mass. That's where we're going with this. To get there, you have to write what's called a mole-mole factor. And what that is, is just the ratio of moles for any two substances in an equation. Let's say that I wanted to write a mole-mole factor for the relationship between iron and sulfur. I would look at iron, which has a two, sulfur has a three. And I would write how many moles of iron are in the equation. Two moles of iron. On the bottom, I'd write how many moles of sulfur directly from the equation. That is a mole-mole factor. For every two moles of iron, you need three moles of sulfur. Just like any factor, you can write the reciprocal. For every three moles of sulfur, 
you require two moles of iron to react. What if I wanted to look at the relationship between sulfur and the iron 3 sulfide? Still looking at that sulfur with the 3 moles directly from the equation. We don't see a coefficient in front of the iron 3 compound. Remember that if you don't see that, it just means a 1. So we need 3 moles of sulfur if we want to make 1 mole of iron 3 sulfide. Then you can write the reciprocal. So that's all that we're doing here. We're taking the moles directly from the equation and writing how many moles with iron, how many moles of sulfur, and that's the relationship. How many moles of sulfur, how many moles of iron 3 sulfide, that's the relationship. Let's do a learning check. We have an equation where we are producing ammonia gas. We've got hydrogen gas, nitrogen gas, making ammonia. A mole-mole factor for NH3 and H2 is, and then we've got three choices. All we have to do is figure out what numbers go with each of these compounds. With NH3, there's a 2. So we should see 2 moles of NH3. For hydrogen gas, there's a 3 in front of it. So it should be 3 moles of hydrogen gas. Whether the nitrogen or the ammonia is on top or the bottom doesn't matter, as long as we've got the right numbers. So A, we have one mole of hydrogen, two moles of NH3. That's wrong. The numbers are wrong. Two moles of ammonia and three moles of hydrogen gas. That sounds right. C, we've got three moles of nitrogen and two moles of NH3. Well, that doesn't even have hydrogen in it, so that's got to be wrong. Now let's write the other mole-mole factor. If we've got two moles of NH3 on top, then we can write the reciprocal where it's on the bottom. Make sure that you can write mole mole factors. We're just taking the coefficients from the chemical equation and writing them down as fractions. That's it. The reason why we want to know how to write these mole mole factors is because we can use them to do calculations to figure out how much product we're going to make. Here, the question is, how many moles of iron 3 oxide can form from 6 moles of oxygen? Always rewrite the question. 6 moles of oxygen gas. How many moles of iron 3 oxide can we make? That's our question. How do we answer it? 
first thing that we have to do is write our mole mole factors relating oxygen and iron three oxide. Then we use one of them to convert moles of oxygen to moles of iron three oxide. Let's write the mole mole factors. We're only concerned with oxygen and the iron three oxide. You can just pretend that that iron, the four iron, that it's not even there. We don't care about it. The question is asking about oxygen and iron three oxide. So that's what our mole mole factor needs to have. I see a three for the oxygen, so that means three moles of oxygen gas. I see a two in front of the iron three oxide. That means two moles. That's a mole mole factor. The second one is just going to be the reciprocal. Then we set up our problem. If we're starting with moles of oxygen gas and we want to figure out how many moles of iron three oxide, we have to choose the mole mole factor that has moles of oxygen in the denominator so we can cancel it out. Our units cancel, so when you figure this out, you're taking 6, multiplying by 2, and dividing by 3. Don't forget to divide by 3. Here's our answer. Our answer has two sig figs. Whenever you're dealing with a mole mole factor, these are exact numbers. They don't contribute to sig figs. Again, if sig figs, scientific notation, um, any of those things from chapter one, chapter two, if you are uncomfortable with conversions, go back and revisit it. There's no harm in that. It'll help make chapter seven a little bit easier. Now we're getting to the good stuff. Mass calculations. If you're given the mass of a substance in a reaction, we can calculate the mass in grams of another substance in that same reaction. So let's say we're trying to figure out how much product we should make. We can take the amount of our reactant and then with some fancy dancy math, which isn't really fancy dancy, it's just conversions, we can figure out how much product. This is how you convert from mass of one thing to mass of another.
you need to know the grams and you need to know the molar mass. That gets you to moles. Then you use a mole mole factor to get you to moles of B. You take your molar mass of B and you get to grams. What does that look like? I have grams of A and then I've got my molar mass factor. So MM, remember that's molar mass of A. The next conversion is going to be the mole mole factor and that's the number of moles of B what you're interested in over the number of moles of A what we already know and this will make more sense once we put some numbers to it finally you want to take the moles of B which is where you are and use the molar mass to figure out grams. So we're taking grams of A to moles of A, moles of A to moles of B moles of B to grams of B. That's our plan. This slide has exactly what we talked about on the previous slide, only in words. So we've got it for all those people who are kind of visual creatures and then those who like to have the words. I'm trying to have everybody covered here. But what I think is most important is that we do an actual example. Don't focus so much on what the exact answer is of the problem and make sure that you understand how you can identify the type of problem you're solving and how to get from point A to point B. Suppose we want to determine the mass in grams of ammonia that can be produced from 32 grams of nitrogen in the following equation. And here we have how to generate ammonia. This is our plan. No, first we have to write our question. Then we go to our plan. We have 32 grams of nitrogen gas. We want to figure out how many grams of ammonia we can make with that. What do we need to do? First, we need to calculate the molar masses of nitrogen gas and ammonia. If you don't remember how to do that, or if that was difficult, go back to Chapter 7, Part 2. We covered how to calculate molar mass. I'm not going to show it here, I'm just going to write it out. So 28.014 grams is the molar mass of nitrogen gas. So that's the mass of one mole of N2. We've got 17.031 grams, and that's one mole of ammonia.
we did our first step. Calculate the molar masses. Step two, we need to write out our plan. And that plan is going to take us from grams of nitrogen gas to grams of ammonia. If we start with the mass of nitrogen gas, which is what we're given, We need to go from there to moles of nitrogen gas. In part two, we talked about how to get there. You have to use the molar mass. Once we have that, we can take the moles of nitrogen gas and get to the number of moles of ammonia. That's where our mole-mole factor comes in. And it's going to be B over A. The B is the thing that we want to know about. A is the one that we have information on. So when we write that mole-mole factor, we want the moles of ammonia on top and the moles of nitrogen on the bottom. The final step, we need to get to grams, which is the mass of ammonia. We need the molar mass of ammonia. Now let's start filling this in. The third part is fill in the numbers. So we're starting with 32 grams of nitrogen gas. We know our molar mass of nitrogen gas is 28.014 grams for every mole of nitrogen gas. Next, we need our mole mole factor. That's what we get from the chemical equation. We need to know ammonia, which is NH3, and that's two moles. Over nitrogen. When you don't see a coefficient, it's one. And finally, the molar mass of ammonia. Grams go in the top this time. Let's check to make sure that our units cancel. We're starting with grams of nitrogen. We're getting rid of that because we want moles. Check. We made a mole-mole factor to go from moles of nitrogen to moles of ammonia.
check. Then we use the molar mass of NH3, ammonia, to convert from moles to mass. All of that should check out. If your units do not cancel, then your number is going to be wrong. When you put this in your calculator, you're taking 32, dividing it by 28.014, multiplying that by 2, and multiplying that by 17.031. Your answer should have two sig figs. thirty nine grams. Don't forget your units. Units are important. The biggest step here is making sure that you keep your units in all of your conversion factors. If you don't keep the units in your conversion factors, then it's easy to flip one and you're using the wrong conversion factor. So don't skip that step. Let's do another. The reaction between hydrogen gas and oxygen gas produces 13.1 grams of water. How many grams of oxygen reacted? So our question, if we rephrase it, 13.1 grams of H2O. How many grams of oxygen is that? What we're going to do first is calculate the molar mass of the two substances in our question. I'm not going to show you the math for that, but again, if you need to kind of go back and refresh yourself, look at part two for chapter seven. There is oxygen, there's water. Pretend like you don't even see the hydrogen there because we don't care about it in the reaction. We're focused on the oxygen gas and the water. Second step, we're going to write our plan. This will help us stay on track when we're filling in all the numbers. We're going to start with the mass of water. Try to keep the colors consistent here. And convert that to moles of water. You need the molar mass to do that. Then we take those moles of water and convert it to moles of oxygen gas. That's where our mole mole factor comes in. What we're interested in is the oxygen and that goes on top of our mole mole factor. The moles of water will go on the bottom. And if you're saying to yourself, well, how do you know that? When I went over the generic how to solve these problems, 
it had the mole-mole ratio of B over A. B is what you're trying to get to. In this case, it's the amount of oxygen. A is what we're starting with. If that doesn't make sense, if you just want to see the math and use the math to get there, then I'll show you that too when we're going through and canceling our units. Whichever way makes sense to you, that's what you hold on to. Now that we're in moles of oxygen gas, we need to get to grams of oxygen gas. That requires the molar mass of oxygen. Now we fill in our numbers and all of our conversion factors. The mass we're starting with is 13.1 grams of water. The molar mass, we said one mole of water is equal to 18.015 grams. I want to cancel out those grams. So I put it in the bottom. On top, we'll put one mole of water. Next is the mole-mole factor. We care about oxygen over water. Because we have water and we're trying to get to oxygen, so the moles of water have to go on the bottom. How many moles of water? You look at the chemical equation. 2H2O means 2 moles of water. Oxygen gas. We don't see a coefficient here, so we say it's one. One mole of oxygen gas. Last but not least, we use the molar mass of oxygen gas to get to the number of grams. Don't forget that oxygen gas is O2. So don't forget that when you're doing your molar mass. We want to get rid of moles, end up with grams. So one mole of O2 goes in the bottom. The number of grams goes in the top. Now let's make sure that we actually did all we wanted to do that we laid out in our plan. Grams cancel and we're left with moles. That's moles of water. Moles of water cancel. We're left with oxygen. Moles of oxygen. Moles of oxygen cancel. We're left with grams. Using sig figs, we're going to need three sig figs here. You should get 11.6 grams of oxygen gas. I encourage you to go through and type all of this out into your calculator and make sure that you get the same thing. One, double check me. Sometimes I make mistakes. But two, most importantly for you, make sure that you get the right answer. You don't want to go through that work, but then not know how to put it into your calculator. And in this situation, you've got the answer right in front of you. So if you don't get the same thing, you need to figure out what it is that you're doing wrong. That's something you can bring to office hours or to a tutor. We're bringing it on home. We're getting a little bit more complicated. We're going to talk about limiting reactants and percent yield. 
A limiting reactant in a chemical reaction is the substance that's used up first. It gets used up, it limits the amount of product that you can make. The reactant that doesn't get completely used up is called the excess reactant. You have some left over. I usually give an example about making grilled cheese sandwiches. Your book talks about making peanut butter sandwiches. I prefer grilled cheese. But if you have two slices of bread two slices of cheese in my mind you need at least two pieces of cheese one piece of cheese that's sad you just you better off eating the slice of cheese and calling it a day if you take the time to make a grilled cheese with one piece of cheese that's not even gonna melt to the whole edge of the bread but I digress. That makes one sandwich. Now, let's say that I have eight slices of bread, but I've still only got two slices of cheese. I'm still only able to make one sandwich. Why? Because my cheese limits how many sandwiches I can make. If each sandwich has to have two slices of cheese, which it does, then all you can do is make one sandwich. That is the limiting reactant. It's the same concept, but with chemicals. Oftentimes in the real world, you're going to have a limiting reactant. Something is expensive. Maybe it's hard to make. It's hard to source. So something is going to limit how much product you can make. And given a chemical reaction, we can calculate the amount of product, product possible to make from each reactant that we have when it's completely consumed. And then we can determine which reactant is actually limiting, which one will run out first and produce a smaller amount of product. Smaller. This will come up. It's one of those things where you're in the midnight hour, you're trying to finish your homework, or you've only got a couple of more questions left on your exam, and then you see limiting reactant. Your heart starts to race a little bit faster. Eyes start to glaze over, but you fight yourself through it. Remember, limiting reactant is the one that produces the smaller amount of product. This will make more sense as we do some examples. I've got three moles of carbon monoxide, five moles of hydrogen gas. How many moles of methanol can I make and what is the limiting reactant? What we're really doing is answering two different questions. If I have three moles of carbon monoxide, how many moles of methanol do I make? I can't help myself. I never write methanol as C4, CH4O. It's always CH3OH in my brain. It's the same thing. What is life without a little bit of variety? 
that's the first question that we have to answer. If I have three moles of carbon monoxide, how much methanol will I make? The second question is, if I have five moles of hydrogen gas, how much methanol will I, ma will I make? These are pretty simple problems. We've already been doing these types of questions. We just need a mole-mole factor. We get that from the problem. We care about carbon monoxide and methanol. Each of those, we're going to say that coefficient is 1 because we don't see it in the chemical equation. When you don't have a coefficient written out, that means it's 1. It's 1 to 1 here, so you're going to make 3 moles of methanol. Let's switch colors here. With the hydrogen, the mole-mole ratio is going to be a little different. If I have 5 moles of hydrogen, I need a mole-mole ratio that has moles of hydrogen in the bottom. I see 2H2 in the equation, so that must mean 2 moles of hydrogen gas. I write that in the bottom. I still have the same 1 mole of methanol in the top. I take 5, divide by 2, I would make 2.5 moles of methanol. Now we have to ask the question, which reactant produces the least amount of product? The answer to that is going to be the smaller number. 2.50 moles of methanol is smallest. That means the 5 moles of hydrogen is going to be our limiting reactant. So our answer is that H2 is limiting, that's the limiting reactant, and how many moles can be produced? 2.50 moles of methanol. So we did each of our mini problems first, and then we asked the question, which reactant produces the least amount of product? That one is our limiting reactant, and whatever amount of product we make from the limiting reactant is the amount we produce. In this case, it's 2.50 moles of methanol. We can do the same kind of mass to mass pro problem as we did in the previous section to figure out the limiting reactant and what mass of product we will make. We're just doing it twice. So that's what this slide lays out for you.
I'll introduce a problem here, and then on the next slide, I'll solve it for you. Silicon carbide. It's a ceramic material, tolerates extreme temperatures really well. It's used as an abrasive in the brake discs of sports cars. Remember, when you're braking, it gets really hot. So it needs to be able to stand up to getting really hot and then cooling off and being cold. Those are extreme temperatures. How many grams of carbon monoxide are formed from 70 grams of silicon dioxide and 50 grams of carbon? And we have the complete balanced chemical reaction below. So I stripped down all the fancy words and I just have the question. We've got 70 grams of silicon dioxide, 50 grams of carbon. How much carbon monoxide are we going to make? Let's write out our two questions. We've got 70 grams of silicon dioxide. We need to figure out how many grams of carbon monoxide that is. The second question, we've got 50 grams of carbon. How much carbon monoxide can we make with that? So this is one of those mass to mass questions that we have to do twice. One for the silicon dioxide, one for the carbon. We're going to need the molar masses here. That's for silicon dioxide. That's for carbon monoxide. Now that we have that, I'm going to just go ahead and start writing out our problem with the numbers. When you feel comfortable, you can skip to that step two. I'm doing that really for space constraints, but I'll talk you through it. We start with the mass of the silicon dioxide. We're going to use the molar mass to figure out how many moles. After that, we need a mole-mole ratio. Same thing as a mole-mole factor. We are looking at carbon monoxide and silicon dioxide. We want to get rid of moles of silicon dioxide, so we should put that on the bottom. Remember, there's an implied one here if there's no coefficient listed. We put the moles of carbon monoxide on top. That's the mole-mole factor. Last thing we have to do is use the mass of carbon monoxide to convert to grams. When you do all that, 
you should get 65.3 grams of carbon monoxide. Now we've got to do the same thing, but with the carbon. One mole of carbon is 12.01 grams. And we already know the molar mass of carbon monoxide, but I'll rewrite it. That's 28.009 grams. Starting with the mass of carbon, 50. We're first going to convert that to moles. Next, we use our mole mole factor. This time, we care about carbon and carbon monoxide. We're getting rid of the moles of carbon, so that should go on the bottom. Three moles of carbon comes from the three in the chemical equation. The two moles of carbon monoxide comes from the two in the chemical equation in front of carbon monoxide. Then we use the molar mass of carbon monoxide, just like last time, to figure out the number of grams. When you do that calculation, you get 77.7 .7 grams of mono carbon monoxide. Now what's the question we answer? Which reactant produces the least product. The answer to that is the silicon dioxide. 65.3 grams is less than 77.7. .7. That means that it's limiting. And if we combine the 70 grams of silicon dioxide and 50 grams of carbon, we will make 65.3 grams of carbon monoxide. So these problems are not hard, but you must pay attention to detail. Hopefully the different colors help you to see the different pieces. And if it does, I encourage you to use colors. Use color pencils, markers, crayons, whatever you have. Even if you have to use a pencil, a black pen, and a blue pen, you can do it. Use the colors to help convince yourself of what you're doing, that you're getting rid of these units, you're doing this step to go from grams to moles, from moles to moles of something else, to grams of something else. Let's add on one more concept. I know, you don't want me to do that, but I have to. I know you can do it. If you take your time, give it a little bit more time than you think it deserves, you will do far better than you ever imagined you could. In the real world, reactions do not give you 100% yield. So all those calculated calculations we were just doing, that's kind of pie in the sky, ideal situation. Sometimes the reaction does not go to completion, 
you lose some reactant or product, not in the it disappears way, but in the you didn't scrape it all out or you drop some, whatever. The amount of product that you actually produce may be less than the theoretical yield. The theoretical yield is the maximum amount of product, which is what we were calculating using a balanced equation. The actual yield is the amount of product you actually obtain doing your experiment. The percent yield tells you the ratio of the actual yield to the theoretical yield. And this is the equation. Let's do a problem. We are going to combine a lot of concepts here. We are on a space shuttle. Lithium hydroxide is used to absorb exhaled carbon dioxide from breathing air to form lithium bicarbonate. What is the percent yield of the reaction if 50 grams of lithium hydroxide gives 72.8 grams of lithium bicarbonate. So let's break this down. We need to figure out a percent yield. We're given a couple of numbers in this problem. fifty grams of lithium hydroxide. Lithium hydroxide is a reactant. Seventy two point eight grams of lithium bicarbonate. That's a product. That means that that 72.8 grams is our actual yield. We can use that when we're calculating the percent yield. But what we don't know is the theoretical yield. So in this problem, we need to calculate that. And we're calculating that from the 50 grams of lithium hydroxide. We always start by figuring out the molar masses of the substances we care about. We've got lithium hydroxide and its molar mass and lithium bicarbonate and its mass. Now I'm going to set up the problem with the same color coding as we've been doing. Starting with the lithium hydroxide, we're going to convert that mass to moles. We always use a molar mass. Make sure that you write out your units completely. I know it takes a little bit of extra time, but that little bit of extra time will save you points on your exam and on 
your homework. Next is the mole-mole ratio, which we got from the problem. Finally, we use the molar mass of lithium bicarbonate. That will give us how many grams we would calculate or it would help us to calculate how many grams we would make if this reaction went to completion. So that's our theoretical yield. It's bigger than the actual yield, and that's okay. The second step is to calculate the percent yield. That's what we came here for. So if you just stopped there, well, that's great. You can do a mass-to-mass -mass problem, but... You need to be able to take it that one step further and connect it with the percent yield. Our percent yield is the actual yield over the theoretical yield. And you multiply that ratio by 100%. The actual yield, we were told in the problem, 72.8 grams. The theoretical yield, we calculated that, 142 grams. Do that division, multiply by 100%. you'll get 51.3%, which isn't exactly great, but it's better than nothing. So that concludes just the kind of stoichiometry piece that we've been working on so far. There's still some more to chapter, chapter 7, but we're exiting the the hardest part in my opinion. In chapter, I keep saying chapter like it's a different chapter. It is still chapter seven, but in part one, we talked about evidence for chemical changes. And one of the pieces of evidence that you might observe is heat being absorbed or heat being released. In this section, we're going to talk about the energy in chemical reactions. Pretty much every reaction involves the loss of loss or gain of energy. We're going to be able to calculate the loss or gain of heat for exothermic and endothermic reactions. We're back to using the SI unit for energy, which is the joule. Oftentimes, you'll see kilojoules, which is that little k with the j. One kilojoule is equal to 1,000 joules. Remember your prefixes. Kilo means 1 times 10 to the third or 1,000. The heat of the reaction, that's the amount of heat that's absorbed or released during a reaction. The change in energy occurs when the reactants interact, you've got bonds breaking apart, and you've got products forming, which means that you're forming new bonds. The heat of reaction, which its symbol is the delta H, is the difference in energy of the products and the reactants. 
you'll need to remember this. In an exothermic reaction, heat is released. That means that the energy of the products is less than the energy of the reactants. So when you're looking at a reaction, you can think about heat being on the product side. That corresponds to a negative delta H. Negative equals exothermic. With an endothermic reaction, heat is being absorbed. So the products are going to have higher energy than the reactants. You can think about an endothermic reaction with heat as a reactant. It's on the reactant side. That delta H is going to be positive So positive delta H, endothermic. Products, higher energy. We can calculate the amount of heat using very similar math to our conversion factors and our mole-mole ratios. Let's say that we've got a decomposition reaction. If we have liquid water, it decomposes to make hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. To do this, you need to put in a lot of energy. We see it on the reactant side. So this must be endothermic. When you put in 572 kilojoules of energy, then you can take the two moles of water and break it down into its constituents. We can write conversion factors to show how much energy you need and the number of moles in the chemical reaction. So this is very similar to the mole-mole factor, but instead of two mole values, you've got energy and moles. The moles still come from the chemical equations. Let's do a sample. How much heat in kilojoules is released when nitrogen and hydrogen react to form 50 grams of ammonia? We have the reaction here, and we know that the delta H is 92, negative 92.2 kilojoules. For an exothermic reaction, where the delta H is negative, that means that we can add in that energy on the product side. So I'm going to rewrite our equation. and I'm going to include that 92.2 kilojoules. So I just wanted to show you how you can take that information about the delta H and put it into your chemical equation. 
we're already told that heat is released. So that's not necessarily a part of your answer. But I want you to be able to see how to go from this negative delta H to where it's supposed to go in the chemical equation. Okay, now let's do the actual math. We're given 50 grams of ammonia. And we need to know how many kilojoules of energy are released. We can't jump directly from grams of ammonia to the amount of energy. We have to instead go from grams of ammonia to moles of ammonia. Then we can go from moles to kilojoules. We'll need the molar mass of ammonia and that will help us when we're writing our conversion factor. We need to have grams of ammonia on the bottom. So that's where we're going to put it to cancel it out. and the one mole of ammonia goes on top. That's our molar mass. The next thing that we have to do is write some kind of a conversion factor to go from the moles of ammonia to kilojoules. Just like with the mole-mole factor, you take the numbers directly from the equation. We're trying to get rid of the moles of ammonia. So that should go in the bottom. That 2 comes from the equation. If we have two moles of ammonia being formed, then we're also going to release 92.2 kilojoules of energy. So first we have moles of ammonia, then energy. You take the 50 grams, divide by 17.031, multiply by 92.2, divide by 2. So with these, you really have to be careful and make sure that you're multiplying and dividing as needed. We've got three sig figs here, so our answer needs to have three sig figs. It's 135 kilojoules released. Let's talk a little bit about chemistry linking to health. Cold packs and hot packs. If you play sports, you absolutely are familiar with this. If not, you may not have had to use a cold pack or a hot pack, but let me tell you something. You get a little bit older. You hit that 30, okay? You hit that 3-0. And your body will tell you, hey, all right. Now, look, you need to have some Epsom salts, and you need to have some cold packs and heating pad, okay? Now, they make hot packs, which are convenient too, but I have a heating pad. Just plug that bad boy in and use it. Anyway, inside of the cold pack, 
you have solid ammonium nitrate. It's in a separate compartment. In another compartment, you have water. When you hit it or you squeeze it, the compartments break open and the ammonium nitrate mixes with the water. That's an endothermic reaction. So what you're doing is you're cooling whatever that, I that ice pack hits, okay? It's a cold pack, but I call everything an ice pack like my grandmother used to, okay? Don't judge me. But that's an endothermic reaction. It's taking the heat from the environment and sucking it in. Works great if you need something cold. But what if you need something hot and you don't have the privilege of plugging in a, a heating pad? You can use a hot pack. Now these are really good for like football games and other sporting events where it gets cold. Now in North Carolina, it doesn't really get cold like that. But in Michigan, going to those football games, you had the little, you know, warmers that you would squeeze and it would get hot. Those are hot packs. It's solid calcium chloride and water. You squeeze it or you hit it, just like the cold pack. Everything mixes together. But this reaction is an exothermic reaction. So when that calcium chloride dissolves, it starts releasing energy. You release the energy, it goes into your hands. Your hands get nice and toasty, and you can continue to cheer on your sports team of interest. Here's the concept mapped for chapter seven. Lots of terms, lots of practice problems, lots of math. If this helps you to kind of place it all together, go for the gold. That's what I always say. Make sure that you tune into the live lecture. You don't wanna miss it. We always do practice problems. I will give you tips and hints for how to do homework and exams. So make sure that you join. If you haven't joined ever at all in the semester, you don't want to miss it this time. From here on out, when we're doing all the math, you definitely want to join. There is a value add when you come to lecture and you actually participate. You try the problems, get feedback, and learn how to do these problems. Thanks for watching. Be safe, and I'll see you soon.